adults are just as nuts as kids. The, the easiest way to parent is not by discipline, but by embarrassment. How many of you have ever been embarrassed by something your parents or guardians have done? I'm raising my hands because I certainly have. There she was, just walking down the street. No, Dad, stop! You know? it, it's weird when you're in a band like this because we have no musical talent. We are one of the worst bands on earth. But we're unusual. And so um, all sorts of musicians want to play with us. And uh, that includes, and has included, uh, Bruce Springsteen who played with our band, and after he played a couple songs with our band, he pulled us all together and he said, guys, don't get any better, or you'll just be a lousy garage band. So he had us below a lousy garage band. Um, I play bass in the band, Stephen King plays rhythm guitar, Dave Barry plays uh, lead guitar and some rhythm guitar. I grew up in Connecticut, in a house much like this, um, outside of New York, my father got on a train every morning and went about an hour into New York City and worked for Shell Oil Company and then came back out every night. I didn't see a lot of them. Uh, we lived in a really fun lane of houses like this with lots of kids. My cousins, uh, my mother's sister's daughter and sons, uh, there were five of them. They lived right next door to us. So we had really a family of eight kids. And I was the youngest of this group, so I actually ended up the one they tortured and uh, took fun of. I had a very wonderful mother in that um, she's still alive. She's getting a little loony, but she's still alive. Mother was a fine artist, and um, she had a, a syndicated column in 55 newspapers, so she, she had this life beyond the life in our family. But she would do things like every summer she would go and buy tons of art supplies and invite all the kids in all the neighborhoods around where we lived and we'd have a big art fair out back. Um, they could, you know, kids could do finger painting or clay or this or that. I crawled around inside the woods in the spring when the, when the snow had bent all the bushes down and I ran into a pheasant. I had this absolutely primal urge to kill the thing. And I grabbed onto a rock, and I'm a terrible baseball player, and I threw this rock, and I hit the poor bird right in the head, and it just fell over dead. And it trashed me. I mean, I thought, what have I done? I didn't even know where this urge came from. It must have been some caveman DNA coming out. But I just, I saw the thing, and I went, oh, what? And it goes, ah! And falls over, and then I said, oh, no. So I scoop it up, and and and... It's warm, you know, and I'm thinking, I killed it, and I carry it back to my family, and I'm crying, and my mother hears me distraught and comes outside, and, and I said, you know, I've killed this bird, I feel so terrible, and my mother takes it, and she begins to inspect it, and she said, well, it's not dead, and right then it lifts its head up, I had just knocked it unconscious, and I'm all happy, the bird isn't dead. And, and yet, it isn't in very good shape. It's kind of like a drunken bird. <laughs> it's really been clocked by this rock I threw. And um, my mother decides she should feed it before we let it back out into the woods. So this was, as a writer, this was my introduction to irony. Because the only thing she could find to feed it was bread stuffing for stuffing birds, like at Thanksgiving and Christmas. So this poor pheasant eats a bunch of bread stuff and loves it, and then we turn it back into the woods. But um, it did introduce me to the idea of irony. You know, and I started to figure out that life is different than it seems when we're young. Um, you guys, I'm sure, have already figured that out. And I began to, I think, seek a new world in books, because books would let me into all these incredible places. And I read more and more and more. I found this new world of books, and, and I was kind of um, starstruck by books. I thought I could never be smart enough to write. I thought only really brilliant people write books. But as I say, I was the youngest of these eight kids. So it was decided that I would be the one tortured. And I'm not kidding, they tortured me. There was this one guy in our little lane 
who at night would drive around on his bicycle with a cape on. Um, and, you know, he was, he was quite a crazy guy. And I, as, you, as you get older from being a child, you get to be your age, you get to be older, you realize that life is really filled with a lot of crazy people who all live together, some of whom are in your own family. Um, it took me a while to figure all this out, but this guy, um, he was older than this, but a guy like this was my first hint that, that people are sort of cracked up and crazy. This guy was named Ricky Hart, and he lived down the street. They brought me to Ricky Hart's house one day, and it was very dark and gloomy, and into a room, and they all dressed up in costume, and, then, and so they looked really strange. And they came in, and they, they told me that they were all magicians, and they had a green drink, and that if I drank it, I would die. And then they made me drink it. And it turned out it was 7-Up with food coloring in it. So it was perfectly harmless. But I drank this thinking I was going to die. And of course, it ruined me for life. But they had a great time with it. My brother loved tying me up and leaving me somewhere. So they would tie me up and put me in the attic. And then they would put on masks and capes and you know, dresses. We had one of these attics that was filled with stuff. And they'd come around and go, Woo! In front of my, I just scare the wits out of me. I was this little kid, you know, and I was like, and, and then they'd all leave and they'd get changed back into themselves saying, Oh, what have you been doing? You know, and I was crying and terrified. Um, and this was my life. 